Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Call, and I'm joined today by my brother, the Gritty Broman. How are you, Brent? I'm well. Thank you. On today's podcast, I wanted to talk a little bit about my trip to Arizona, my experience with the Valkyrie Hyde Broadhead, which is what I've got right here. Um, I use this mechanical. And those of you who have been following for a while, I'm a big prom- proponent of fixed blades. So I want to talk about this experience the mechanical heads and kind of where I, what I think about them hint I'm in love with this thing. So that'll be interesting to switch course a little bit on Spoilers. the, on the, uh, the, uh, mechanical broadhead hate that I normally drop. It's hard to call that a mechanical broadhead when it's like quadruple the weight of the regular broadhead. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting. We'll get into that discussion. Uh, before we do that, I want to remind you to check out mountain ops, use the code gritty at mountain ops, get yourself some, uh, you know, ignite, Yeti, Slumber, Blaze, I uh, like uh, all the things. They got water bottles. They got uh, new workout clothes. The workout clothes are cool. Yep, and I like the uh, Merinos. So check it all out. Use the code GRITTY. It helps us out, uh, helps our partners out. And uh, use the code GRITTY over at Peaks. Get yourself some trekking poles. Get yourself a hat or a shirt. Uh, get yourself some uh, gators. Those are all available at Peaks. And use the code GRITTY at Backcountry Fuel Box to get yourself some backpacking foods that you can test out. It's a cool little service that our friend Cody Rich puts on with the Rich Outdoors podcast. Um, basically, you get a box in the mail every month, and it's full of backcountry fuel, goodies, meals, bars, uh, snacks. I love it. I'm snacking on this one right now. This is the salted watermelon shop blocks, but there's so much in there. And when you get the box, it comes every month. By the time you've got that box for six months, you are still you are set for hunting season. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and if you really wanted a particular product in there, they've got coupon codes for every product in the box. Yes. And then what's also cool about that is you don't even know what to shop for. Mm-hmm. You start getting good ideas and it's, it's broad. So you, you're not going to get the same thing all the mm-hmm. time. You get, you get to taste and test a lot of things you don't even know exists. Mm-hmm. So great. If you're back country, dude, I highly recommend it. Use the code gritty and uh, get a discount. And that helps us too. And lastly, use the code Gritty for goat knives. Uh, I think it's Gritty Goat, actually. I think it's it gritty is. Well, goat. Yeah, gritty Goat. Gritty Goat over at Goat Knives. Our friend Travis Nowatney has put together a couple of knives that are really legit. I love uh, what he's doing over there at Goat Knives. Ryan and I put the knives through the paces. They have one that goes around your neck, a lot like the Benchmade Altitude, which has been a favorite of ours. Basically, Goat Knives has a similar version, but it's less expensive, still has incredible steel like nitro steel and keeps its edge forever. We loved it. We put it through the paces, confident in the product. We like it. It's Goat Knives. Use the code Gritty Goat. Get yourself a discount. And then he also sells the Capra TI, I think it's called, or mm-hmm. and it's the replaceable blade Goat Knife. I think so it's the Capra Hunter TI. So it, yeah. yeah, it's got the you, the standard like Havilon blade, replaceable surgical blade. surgical blade. So you throw that on there, and then it's pretty cool because it's got the a, a handle that I think is fits nice. I like the handle, and it's got the little hex tools that go inside the handle. Mm-hmm. They, so if you've got your bow like this, this is my quiver here on my bow. Um, I can I, all these little all these little uh, hex keys and stuff. Same with my sight. You can in bed like four of those different sizes and they're right inside the handle and they're lightweight and the handle acts as a Lever. as a wrench mm-hmm. and so it's pretty cool to have it's just just to pack all that and have it ready to go check that out uh goat knives gritty goat and uh with that let's get into the podcast so i i wanted to talk about my experience with the broadheads i'm gonna have brent hahn on he's the owner of valkyrie archery he was with me when i shot my buck by the way we had hunted we hunted he was out there hunting arizona the whole time but we connected a few times and on that particular day i was like i could use some help you know keeping eyes on this buck while i go in on this stock and uh, he was gracious and helped me kill that buck he he was having trouble like everyone else finding a mature buck to go after and there were a few days where it was like, yeah, I'll help you out, man. If uh, I don't have anything better, I hunted this morning, couldn't find anything. You're on a buck. I'll come over there. So he'd drive like an hour over to where I was at. And then we he'd he helped me out. So can't thank him enough. And um, Brent's been a good friend of mine for a long time, friend of the show. Uh, he I first met him when I went and met Joel Turner with Shot IQ. And we did some podcasts on 
iron mine shooting. And it was a great, uh, changed my whole view on archery and how I shoot and execute a shot. If you don't know Joel Turner and shot IQ, you need to. Um, anyway, there's a podcast out there with us somewhere. Yeah. And I think if you just Google Joel Mm -hmm. and shot IQ, you'll find stuff. But Brent Hahn was at the time, this was years ago. He was developing that center pin Mm -hmm. system and trying to develop a heavy front of center arrow, knowing that front of center matters, you know, it, it impacts, it helps with arrow flight. You, You had your, um, Dr. Ashby had done a bunch of studies and others and, it was clear that when you have uh, an arrow that's really heavy up front and the most of the weight is up front, instead of it being evenly distributed throughout the shaft, you put the weight really far forward, front of center, and it kind of, it, it changes the dynamics, the the physics of the arrow, and mm-hmm. it flies a little differently, it penetrates differently, and um, there's a lot of benefits to it. So my, Brent, land, my landlord is a rocket propulsion engineer. Yeah. And I was explaining to him the broad hedge. He goes, huh, that's how rockets work. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know, but I, I think that that's really cool because Brent went on a little journey with that and he ended up with a setup that um, gives you that front of center and that devastation, uh, but keeps your arrow speed up. You know, a lot of times what you do just to have devastation is shoot a 500 grain arrow. But if you can get similar penetration out of a 400 grain arrow, but with the weight up front, as you do with a 500 grain arrow evenly distributed, well, now you just picked up a lot of arrow speed and arrow speed kills too when it's combined with weight. So there's a momentum factor involved. So that's a whole long story that we're not going to get into in today's podcast, but we'll do that with Brent. But the the idea on this show is I wanted to go over um, my setup for killing this buck and what I did um, for this hunt. So I use Black Eagle X Impact arrow shafts and they're micro diameter shaft. Um, and I love I love uh, Randy Kitts over at Black Eagle and he makes some awesome the Rampage. He makes a, a lot of nice arrows, but I really like the the Valkyrie system and there's only a couple of platforms where you can effectively build it on and black eagle x impact is one of them and what bren has done is he's he's built a, he's taken these micro diameter shafts and what would happen with these is um right here at the front they would they would snap off on if they hit a bone or a shoulder at an oblique angle and so he built the center pin uh design so that the broadhead itself has this long pin right here. And if you're watching the video, it's like an inch and a half pin that extends the length of the broadhead, basically, so that it reinforces, because this is all one piece, the strength of the, the tip here. So he quit having micro diameter shafts break on him. So it solved a real problem. Uh, also, he increased the whole weight of the broadhead. So I'm shooting 200 grain heads out of my my bow for my for elk, and uh, it's devastating. And so that that Black Eagle X Impact shaft, it's lightweight. It allows you to have that micro diameter as well. So when you penetrate and you go through, there's less drag, there's less wind drag. There's a lot of benefits to the micro diameter, and then all that weight is up front on that sh- on that head. It just it's devastating. And on the back end, on this. I have the heat veins, the boning heat veins, and uh, I have a three three fletch. Now, this is a lot different than my than my uh, setup I was using for elk. I'll go over what I was using for elk, and then I'll contrast it with this with this new arrow rig. So, my elk, I'm shooting the same bow. So, this is a Hoyt RX4, and it's 80 pounds, and uh, I think it's a 28 and a half or 28 inch 28 inch draw. I think is what it is. I don't have a long draw length, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I I like the heavier poundage, by the way. Twenty eight uh, or, or eighty pounds is not a hard pull for me or a hold, and um, I like it with with very little let off. You know, I, I prefer to have um, to hold have a higher holding weight, and so I just think it's better at full draw. I can hold it more steady. It's the whole system stiffer. Uh, there's not as much slack in the string nose pressure and face pressure on the string isn't impacted the same because I have a lot more hold weight on the arrow, um, on the bow. I mean, and a lot of people, you know, I don't think they're benefiting from that big let off. It is easier to hold it at full draw for a longer period of time, but for how long and at the expense of how much accuracy I shoot so much better with, um, with a bow that has far less let off. Those extreme let off bows, I don't shoot them well at all. So, and you'll you'll hear a lot of good archers talk about the fact that they put their 
they don't they they have a pretty stout holding weight okay so um that's the arrow the bow right and the arrow i was shooting was a stiffer spine than what i'm shooting now and i have a 200 grain broadhead and i have four fletchings on my elk rig all of that together combined so the weaker spine uh the 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 heavier duty spine i should say for elk increased my arrow weight a little bit because it's just a little bit thicker arrow. I also shortened my new arrow just a touch, like a half inch, because I had room to play with. And I dropped a fletching and went with three instead of four. What's and the point of having three versus four? You know, I don't I don't think there is a point if they fly well. You know, the idea with four with a slight offset is, you know, that it recovers more quickly or shoots more straight. But then the guys at Wild Arrow love these heat veins with a pretty stout helical on them going with three fletch i don't really care i mean as long as they group well shoot whatever and when i was hunting with some with some other buddies they would fletch with totally like they would run setups with three four uh helical just a slight angle straight and they would mess around or fully straight and they would fletch like three or four of each one so they had three or four arrows and uh out of like four or five different brands with the different or the same brand, but with different vein setups. And then they would go out to the range and they'd shoot them. And then they go, which one flew the best, which one gave you the longest range. Now, if you have four, if you have four veins, you're going to have more drag. Mm -hmm. But if you have three veins with a heavy helical, you're going to have drag versus if these were straight, you know, this twist causes it to catch more wind. So there's a lot that goes into that what I was going for though was a faster arrow rig that shot better at long range. So I wanted to lower the weight, but ke- still keep it a devastating arrow. So I think I was 480 grains before, and this put me down around 430. So I think I I dropped about 50 grains by going with a 180 grain head, different arrow shaft, like a, a, a lower uh, spine, and with uh, shortening the length and then three fletching, whatever whatever this combination is. It, it lightened that load, that which was my goal. So that took me from 270 feet per second to right around 288 feet per second. So I picked up like 18 feet per second or something like that. Maybe not as, maybe 15 feet, but it was enough that shooting out to 85 yards, it was more forgiving. My 75 to 85 with my heavier arrow rig, was little was a little unforgiving if you didn't have your elevation exactly perfect where I started to see like this the major drop off in arrow speed and stuff and and the arch more significant with my heavier arrows right around 70 yards where this was getting me around 80 85 yards so it just it gave me a little more confidence at 85 yards than my last rig did where the last rig I was confident out to like 72 you know I just want a little more, little less drop off at the end ranges. That's all I was going for. Little less drop off. I got the rig set up, tuned pretty good. I was shooting bullet holes through paper. And then I threw on the um, practice tips, shot those, liked how the arrows were flying. And I was talking to Brent about, uh, he was talking to me because I'm going to hunt coos deer about these hide um, mechanical broadheads of Valkyrie. And we got to talk and I'm like, yeah, you know, for a coos deer, I mean, they're just, they're dainty. Mm-hmm. Their skin is tiny. They're, they, they got little bird bones, you know, I'm like, this would be cool. Plus they're quick. And sometimes you are poking out longer ranges. You almost got to be a sniper with some of those, of those coos them, deer, yeah. 60 to 70 yards. They're less likely to dodge than at 30 or 40, you know? So I wanted something that was forgiving at those, those end ranges that didn't have as much drop off. And then I wanted a broadhead that would do serious damage. My whole point, I I like mechanicals for the, the, the damage they cause. What I don't like is when the mechanical fails, you know, that's my issue or when it opens in flight twig because it hits a twig, you know, it's got, it's got fail points, right? Mm -hmm. So I started talking to, to, uh, Brent about this. This thing is 200 grains, dude. Check this thing out. It's a giant chunk of stainless steel parts and pieces. The center pin is heavy. The top part is super heavy, heavy duty. Stainless steel, these these deployment blades that come down, they're thick and heavy. So I was like, well, this isn't your, your dad's mechanical broadhead. Mm-mm. I mean, this is like new age stuff. 
heavy duty and you got a 180 grain option and a 200 grain option. Well, I was going to the 180. So I switched, I I dropped down to 180 because I wanted that speed. I might go back up to 200. I'm not sure, but I don't know that I need to because that 180 destroyed that deer and it destroyed that javelina. I, I tested it on two animals. When it comes to flight, they fly brilliant, brilliantly. Like out of the box, they flew just like my field tips. If I were to take the, um, the, my typical fixed blade, Jagger, Jaeger, broadhead with the long tip that I would use for elk. In order to have those fly exactly like my field tips, sometimes they just do. But a lot of times I've got to take the bow. My field tips group here and my, and my, and my broadheads group here. They're tight groups and I got consistency, but they're not exactly hitting to the same impact point. So I go, hey, Jeremiah or, or, or Cody over at Wild Arrow. I need to help me get this thing tuned. They do some voodoo magic on the bow. They they tighten and loosen some strings, and then those those two the the fixed blade and and the field tips converge, and they're all hitting to the same spot or very close. Well, I didn't really have time to deal with all that, and I was talking to Brent because I I wanted this lighter setup, but I I was kind of late getting everything switched over, and I didn't have as much time between work and everything to get my setup. So he's like, "You need to try those mechanicals." You'd really do. Well, right out of the box, dude, they hit exactly the same as my field tips. I knew my field tips were on because I've been shooting them for a few weeks. Throw those things on, I was dead center. I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's cool. cool. And I didn't knock tune these at all. Normally, I would have to knock tune my arrows, meaning I would basically get the spine, you know, I'd find out where, where the weak part of the spine is. <clears throat> I'd face that weak spine of the part of the spine outward on every air, arrow. I'd just kind of twist it on the knock and shoot it through paper until. I'm getting bullet holes and then I mark it and I know that's how it needs to sit on my string, right? So I knock tune each arrow. Then I go out and I shoot my broadheads and my field tips. And then I have the guys tune the bow so that it's perfect. Well, that takes a lot of toying around, you know, and doing all that stuff. I didn't have to do that with the mechanicals. I was good to go right there. So that was nice. I mean, that, I mean, that's pretty cool. And so out to 85 yards, I was drilling the pie plate, pretty stoked on that without having to do a lot of work to get everything um, synced up. The next thing was I was telling Brent, because I'm, I'm a complainer, you know, I complain about these broadheads, about mechanicals and stuff. And I was like, you know, what happens when I have to shoot through some brush and this mechanical head deploys like this and catches and now it like ricochets and goes all over. I want a broadhead that can go through brush that kind of matches the flight of these. And I, and I, I don't have time. And he's like, Oh, well, then you need my long range broadheads. <laughs> so, do you have another question? Yeah. So, here's the Valkyrie. Um, I don't know what he's calling these exactly, um, but they're the LRs, the long range. And these are vented. And you can see they're, they're not the long tip they're ones. Not the giant long Jaggers. Like the Jaggers are. Um, and they're vented. So, they won't plane as easily as a non vented head. Now, mm-hmm. sometimes with vented, they can make a little noise. Yeah. That's why people are leery of them. These don't make any noise, at least on my system. No noise. They fly perfect. They fly just like my field tips do. So what was cool is I could throw this on. And uh, right out of the box, I was good to go. And they match the flight of the of the of of these hide uh, mechanicals. I carry both in my quiver. So I have my mechanicals in there. But then I, I'm looking at a situation. Let's say I have a buck behind a br- some brush. And I'm like, or there's a little grass in the way. And I'm, I'm a little worried about the mechanicals. I've always got this arrow on hand and it flies exactly the same as my mechanical. So I'm good to go. Um, So I like having both. If I got to take an 80, 85 yard shot and I'm confident it's not windy. I've been shooting. I'm dialed. And I'm, I want to shoot the mechanical if there's nothing in my way. And by the time it hits target, man, it's going to blow right through it. Um, And so I, I, I put both in the quiver and that's what I took on the trip to Arizona. And I was really impressed with the setup. Now this is for coos deer primarily in my head. That's what I was thinking. But then I got down there and, um, you know, I started seeing like this, like this, this buck right here. I was like, okay, there's, there's some nice muleys floating around here. Actually, this is the only one I saw. I saw (laughs) one more. I saw one other really good muley, but I really didn't see very many. I, but, and I didn't really see a lot of, it was a tough season, a tough year. And that's on another podcast. We'll talk about that. But, um, so anyway, what happened was I, I ended up targeting this buck when they saw him and, and, uh, was looking around and I was like, I want that deer. 
So I started tracking him day after day and getting on him and following him. And, and, uh, that's a whole film in and of itself. And I'll, I'll publish that film in a week or so. And you guys can follow that story. And it's pretty cool. I love this buck. He's bladed and he's got all this like mass down here. He's thick and heavy. Um, you know, he, I wonder on a non drought year where the monsoon season actually had some rain, you know, this far South where it's desert, 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 you know, they were just, I think all the deer just didn't put on much size, a little starved or just didn't have the nutrition to do it. But anyway, I switched it up and actually hunted mule deer. So I used the broadhead on a mule deer and I'll talk about that in a second. One of the things though, thinking about it and, and especially after having gone through the, the, I already know this, but when I saw what the mechanical broadhead did and I did a forensic analysis and cut open the deer and did all the stuff to see so I could witness it. And I saw how quickly the deer died, how it broke bone and all that and still was effective. Gives me a lot of confidence in the mechanical head that I didn't have going into it. Now I was pretty confident on a coos deer. Sure. But on a mule deer, I don't know. But when you compare a mule deer to an elk, they're in different stratospheres. There's there you can't. There's no comparison. No one's gonna mistake an elk for a mule deer. An elk has a hide that is so much thicker, like thick, and an elk has a hair that is so coarse, and the bones are so thick. And if you try to punch an arrow just through the hair, the hide, and a bone on a rib, that's a whole different arrow setup. Let alone trying to put one through let's say some of the stomach and liver on a quartering away shot and into the vitals, you need penetration. Elk bodies are big. And on any kind of quartering two or frontal shot on an elk, which has been proven to be lethal, you really want that arrow that can just go deep, Mm -hmm. go through muscle and bone and get in there and go in far. And the body cavities are big on elk. Corey just did a frontal shot in that new video and that thing... Yeah, it was br- gushed. Yeah, Destination Elk, Elk 101. Check out those videos right now. There's there's uh, a couple of kills on that that I that I watched. Three actually Brutal right now. Brutal frontal shot. But that frontal shot is like a it's like a hose, mm-hmm. a blood hose. It turned on the faucet. Yeah, it was pretty. Yeah, he hit that artery. He had to have hit mm-hmm. that artery right right there in the neck as it went in. It also hit the lungs and the in the heart. But the artery, it was just done. Dunzo. Mm-hmm. Bucket. Just it looked like someone grabbed a bucket and just threw a bucket full of water. The slow motion. I would like to have seen the slow motion more mm-hmm. on that, but it is a little too graphic for I went and took the playback yes. speed <laughs> on, just, on YouTube and yeah. I cranked it down. So it was even just like, Whoa, like that. Yeah, it's a sight to behold. Um one thing that he could do is black and white it a little bit or mm-hmm. off color it and then show it in slow motion. Maybe YouTube won't censor it as much. Maybe. Um but this whole censorship thing is so annoying another Um, podcast another podcast but my point was elk and deer are vastly different and even Mm -hmm. mule deer are vastly different from a coos deer even i was submit coos deer are just tiny then when you get your hands on a mule deer it's that next level but when you jump from mule deer to elk utterly different and so i was really stoked i'll tell you this from now on i don't think i'll ever hunt uh coos deer or, or i mean mule deer or coos deer without this mechanical broadhead i'm that happy with it and in love with the thing. Um, so my first experience on a live animal was the, the javelina. And, uh, I hit that javelina, the arrow smoked him just right through Mm -hmm. the whole, like all the vitals. The arrow went through him and he was just like, what? He stood there for a sec after he jumped like a foot and then he was like, what? And then he just was like rocking back and forth and Mm -hmm. hit the ground. And it was, it was pretty sudden and pretty quick. He didn't even go anywhere. You know, a lot of times I see these things hit and they sprint a hundred yards or 50 yards. This thing got hit and it was just like, it, it took its soul. To yeah. <laughs> it's just like done. So that was pretty wild to see. I mean, and you can see from this, I mean, you got a 180 grain head. That's something I want to say. Like a lot of mechanicals are a hundred grains or 125 or mm-hmm. even 150. But when you're talking, this one's 200 grains right here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, this one over here on this arrow is, uh, is, a uh, is, 180 they're built almost the same but the and the 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 cut on contact blade is a little i I think they're actually the same the blades might be the same as well but the ferrule is a little thicker and heavier Uh on the 200 grain the ferrule's a little thicker but they're both heavy duty heavy duty with this long um center pin coming down the shaft to 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 strengthen Mm -hmm. the arrow at the head 
at the tip. You're no longer flinging arrows. You're flinging harpoons. This is a heavy-duty chunk of metal. So what happened on, on that javelina was, wow. So then when I shot my buck, he was 43 yards, and basically it hit him center of center, uh, center of the ribs up and down, and about center of the rib cage left to right as well. And it went in one of the thickest ribs right in the center of the body. It went in, when, when, this, when this mechanical deploys, you see how these blades are sticking out from side to side, right? Well, when it went in, the vertical, the blades went in to the, uh, into the, the rib, the rib vertically. vertically. And so that's not what you want with a mechanical, that's especially. the very least ideal way to hit something yeah i mean it just it, it hit that center and so it goes in well it goes in goes through the the lungs and then out the other side and then the arrow buried in the ground about 10 feet beyond the deer into a rocky bank and it was buried in the rocks like like four inches deep into the rocks so i was i, I was uh, you know so then when i hit the buck he spins around and he runs dead sprint up the up uh, straight up a mountain Right. He ran about four seconds and then started to wobble. And then five, mm-hmm. six seconds, he was on the ground. So um, now a buck can co- cover insane, like 150 yards in five, four or five seconds. Yeah. I mean, it's insane. They take like four jumps. Yeah, it was amazing. Like, I was bang, like, bang, whoa. Bang, bang. And I'm looking for blood or some sign that he's going to drop. Hit. Right. Yeah. And you want to see him drop in front of you. Um, but uh, when that arrow pierced him, he was dead gone like a rocket ship. And, uh, and like I said, four or five seconds, six seconds, he was dead. Um, and then when I got up to him, the amount of blood that had come out of his mouth just was, I couldn't get it to stop. It just was like, when I tried to take photos, I'd clean it off and just, it just kept coming. And there was just a mountain of it on the ground right there. It just, you know, when you hit a deer or any animal above center, a lot of times the blood stays inside the body cavity. Mm-hmm. And when you double lung an animal like that, where that blood goes is out the mouth and the nose, the respiratory system. And uh, it doesn't come out the hole so much because the hole is mm-hmm. a little higher. So it bleeds internally first. Now, if you hit them lower than, than center of body, then it'll leak out the hole mm-hmm. and you won't get as much coming out the mouth maybe. But he died so fast. Now, I'm not going to get that kind of death uh, with a fixed blade. It just isn't, it doesn't work that fast. That's not to say, I mean, they die in 60 seconds, just not five, mm-hmm. you know, but look how far they can run in five seconds, yep. six seconds. They can run a long way in 60 seconds. Uh, usually they feel ill at some point mm-hmm. and then they start like stopping and, you know, yeah, and then they stand the around the and we, yeah, <laughs> when they've disappeared. So, and you don't no, get, I just have to climb to the top of the yeah, ridge. Uh, or you don't get as much blood on the ground either because mm-hmm. the hole just isn't as big. Now you get more coast to coast hole often on like a elk size animal you can put this thing from the back rib through the all the way out the front chest with a mechanical it's probably going to go in a foot and stop right so you have a big entry hole but you don't have that continuing um through the whole cavity and then your exit hole mm-hmm. now i don't know about the valkyrie maybe on an elk bone it, it, a rib it'd handle it okay i just it's just not the tool for the job in my opinion the better tool for the job is the Jagger broadhead. And the way that that long pointy tip is built, it's like a bullet through bone. Yeah. I mean, it gets on that bone, it hits that bone. Grips it. Grips it and barely goes in and then boom, explodes it. And it carries on through the body like nothing stopping it. The trajectory stays on point. It, it's just like um, an unstoppable force. And it's still sharp after blowing up bone. And then it keeps going, blows up more bone and then exits. It's amazing. Now, that, of course, that requires a, a little more heavier weight arrow like what i normally sh- shoot in like 480 to 90 or to 500 grains somewhere in that ballpark but seeing what this did to the rib what it did is it cut a notch in the rib vertically that matched the size of the two uh, mechanical blades and it just looked like someone took a jigsaw and cut a c notch that's cool. out of the rib and it just went it just went in and just went and just cut it out like it was just gone and and it didn't stop the head and the arrow kept going um when I pulled the arrow out of the ground, it was missing this 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 blade. One of the blades on it was about halfway gone, and the other one was fully intact. I don't know if that happened when it went into the rock bank or if that happened in the deer. I couldn't find that part. But the hole it made was unreal, in and out, and the death was so fast. And 
I think that head, this this blade will de- destroy um, the bones and give you the shot, you know, just do some serious damage. So for coos deer, mule deer, I'll probably stick to this broadhead for a long time until something genius comes along that beats it. Um, but I'm still going to carry a broadhead that flies excellent at long range that matches the flight of those in the in my quiver as well for shooting through brush or if I do have a, a head on angle or something that I want to take, or I have this in, in the quiver also for that option. But I was impressed, man. I was impressed. I, I was stoked on how, how that performed. So <clears throat> that's my, um, that's my review on that. I mean, I'll show, you can see the video and you'll, <clears throat> when it comes out and you can check it out and you'll see what that looks like. Um, what kind of devastation it caused. I think you're going to find it pretty cool to see that. Um, and kind of see that you'll, you'll see the arrow like post impact. Same with the, the Havelina. I'm pretty damn confident in this, uh, air and this broadhead for, for, for smaller game, pretty dang confident. I will say this, like had I hit my, my Havelina, cause a lot of that's hair, they yeah. got hair on their back hair on their. And so when, when I actually pulled the hide off the Havelina, I realized I didn't aim just right. Really? Now it, was, it was like 43 yards or 45 yards for the Havilene to 40 yards. It was a, it was a poke for such a small, you know, mm-hmm. ball of fur. Um, and, uh, it hit a little high. <clears throat> That's because I aimed where the fur was and there's mm-hmm. just an illusion of fur. It's like when you're aiming at a tar, mm-hmm. it's hard to tell cause it comes down like a skirt or a musk ox, like where, mm-hmm. where exactly oh. is the body it's a, in yeah. this fur coat. And so Havilene have this hair that spikes up behind the neck mm-hmm. and it, and it, curves up and once i pulled that off there was just this illusion of body there and it was really fur so it was actually a little high where it hit hit where i was aiming but my aim point wasn't perfect now had i hit it with a non-mechanical because when you look at this blade and you see how big that hole is uh when you hit that 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 thing with this and it was a more marginal placement that little javelina had didn't matter it didn't matter. The hole was just too big. Mm-hmm. Hole was just too it big. It was bleed out. That's something to be said. I mean, when you have a blade that makes up for any any deficiency in a shot, it's not a magic bullet. You still have to hit the animals in the right spot, yeah. the best you can. But it does give you a little more assurance knowing that you have such a devastating head to work with. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing what these these things do. And being that this is such a heavy duty head. Yeah, I'm very curious. One of my complaints with some of the mechanicals I've seen and used in the past was they have like an aluminum ferrule and they have like blades that come out and they they are almost like loose and shaky. Yeah, they rattle. They rattle and they're really thin and they look like they'll bend or snap off. The The blades on top are not this giant chunk of stainless steel. Like this cut on contact blade is just a giant like dime size mm-hmm. chunk of steel. That ain't... That is not going to have a trouble with a bone. It's not going to bend. It's not going to, it's going to go right through it. Mm-hmm. And I like the cut on contact design, this blunt tip. And one thing about it is if the blade's only halfway deploy or you don't quite get the deployment you want, it, this, this much is still lethal. And this mm-hmm. part of the head is fixed. It doesn't change. So there's good assurance. Like if you do hit it through the lungs, it's dead. It might take a little longer if you didn't get deployment. But I like these heads that have that that sort of fixed head that is always there no matter what. Because some of the heads are built with just a tip. And if it doesn't deploy, you put a pencil size hole through it. You just don't cut enough, you know. So I like the design. I'm impressed. I wanted to get Brent Hahn on here and have him talk about it. Anyone else who's been using these a lot. I've been hearing. A t- I, you get on there and you start following guys that are using this setup. And they're just like, whoa, this is rad. So. Like I said, I have these built. Uh, these are X, Black Eagle X Impact arrow shafts, and then I've got the heat veins. Uh, I've used the AAE veins too, and I like those. We have a code with Valkyrie too, because they Brent works with our show, and you get a discount if you use the code Gritty. It's at ten percent. Yeah, we were advertising five for a long time. Brent's like, uh, guys, it's ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think for a year and a half we've said you get five percent off, but it's actually ten percent. Yeah, we like to uh, over, over under deliver. promise over deliver. So yeah. check that out. Um, I just love the setup. I, I I love it. It's devastating. That front of center is is killer. That's my take. There's a lot of great setups out there. 
though. Mm -hmm. A lot of great arrows out there being built. Uh, and I hate arrow drama because, <laughs> you know, there's so many people with opinions out there. And Ryan has a totally different rig. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's shooting, um, uh, I don't even know. He's switched around a little bit. But um, other guys that I like are shooting a cut on contact, two blade fixed. Some guys are shooting a single bevel fixed, which I think are tried and true designs. Uh, your G five striker, like four, uh, like fixed blades are, are out there. Um, and different companies now have a center pin kind of solution mm -hmm. of some kind to do what Brent has patented here. Now that it's become kind of like, no duh, we should have done this mm -hmm. a long time ago. You're seeing a lot of people come up with this design or something to, to satisfy that design. So you can get that extreme FOC weight up front and have the, the, the tip be strong, even though you're running a micro diameter shaft, there's a lot of designs out there. I just know from using this year over year over year, it is expensive. Brent stuff is expensive, but it is, it is lethal. It is, it is deadly. And it's got a lifetime warranty and he'll sharpen it for you. Yeah. The broadheads have a lifetime warranty and they just will sharpen them. them. So as long as you don't lose it, if you shoot this through a brick wall, which cousin Ben did, <laughs> It didn't do anything to it. He shot it through cinder blocks a couple of times <laughs> and uh, it's fine. You, you can send these in and Brent will fix them, repair them, give mm -hmm. you a new set or. Yeah. And he also has a sharpening kit that he sells. So you can do it at your house if you want to. It's not hard. The sharpening kit goes on a grinder wheel mm -hmm. and you hit one side and the way the bevel is done, oh, a, a, a very unskilled individual can just go and then sharpen their blades. Mm -hmm. I, however, have no patience for that. Same with my knives. Mm -hmm. um, I had this set up and Anthony's like, give it to me and then I'll just sharpen all your blades. So I gave it to Anthony and uh, he does the sharpening for me. But I also just send them in to Brent. Mm -hmm. You got like 15 of these, throw them in a box, send them to Brent and say, sharpen these for me. And their dude sharpen them all and then send them back. It's kind of like a bench made knife situation. It's nice lifetime. They take care of that. So man, can't say enough stuff. about the setup. Anyway, I uh, hope you guys like the video. We're going to try to get the hunt video out in a few days. Mm -hmm. um, both the Havilene and the Arizona. I'm curious what y'all think of that public land hunt over the counter. You know, there are a lot of hunters there and I want to get into that with some discussions with Ryan. I want to get Jim Heffelfinger on here and talk about, the drought and deer behavior and how they eat those cactuses. That's just a, a unsolved mystery to me and um, more, more stuff like that to come. But if you got any more questions about the arrow stuff, let me know. I'm going to talk about the bow uh, on another day. I've gone over my bow rig before archery season. So you can go and look at the video. I talk about the release, the different releases. Cause I have a hinge as well. I talk about, you know, how I shoot, how I practice my setup and what my rig looks like. Um, and how I have this whole thing balanced this bow. I set up with the Garmin zero because it's legal in Arizona and coos deer run around like mad little demons, uh, chasing deer. And so do mule deer. And it is nice to be able to come to full draw long before the animal gets there. But the whole time I'm just getting range, range, range. And when that buck came by and he was at 65, I had a pin Boom. when he was at 55. I had a pin, you know, I knew the exact range. There's no guessing involved when he came down to 40 yards. Mm -hmm. I knew exactly where he was. And when he popped up at 43, I had single pin accuracy mm -hmm. when I decided, okay, now's my moment. I had the exact single pin accuracy, like a slider, mm -hmm. put that thing where I want. And it's just, you bury Otherwise, that pin, you, you focus, keep ranging him, ranging him. With well, if I, pull it's, the it's a lot harder there. It's a lot harder to pull off an, a super lethal, accurate shot. Here's the reality. Without the zero, I would have taken the shot like like I always would have in the past. But what would happen is you'd be guessing. Was it 50? Is it 40? Bef I, I would be ranging, which I do. I knew that the rock that they were going to walk on was 40 yards. I knew that this tree over here was 55. And I knew that beyond that was 75. All that I had figured out. Mm -hmm. But I don't know when they're going to stop exactly. And even then, I put my 40 high. Cause he's beyond the 40 mark. How high, you know, you just have to start pin gapping and guessing the dudes with 30 inch draws 
and you know, 70 pound bows or 80 pound draws, uh, with, with 30 inch draws, they have so much advantage just because their arrow shoots so flat, you know? Um, that's why some of the best archers in the world, like Levi Morgan have wingspans, like an albatross, Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, it's got like a 32 with 33 inch draw or something ridiculous. Oh yeah. Some, some of these are massive dudes. Be- mm-hmm. John Dudley. Cause when you have a 32 inch draw, mm-hmm. your arrow is shooting out of there like a rocket, you know, <laughs> you're, you're getting speeds. You're still shooting speeds and, and stuff that other dudes with much smaller builds can't achieve without some souped up, super hyped up fast bow or poundage or something, you know? And so a little bit of an advantage there. It's, it's, I equate it to, for example, my daughter having just barely being able to pull like 45 pounds and having an arrow set up and it's a light arrow with, with light poundage and her arrow still like has the trajectory of, of, you know, you throwing a spear. Mm Mm-hmm. That's rough. It's rough. You cannot shoot with as much pin gap accuracy. That's why I think the Garmin Zero is awesome for for women and and kids because they they can have that single pin accuracy where it where I can dude I can guess is it thirty five or forty five mm-hmm. and I can wing it and I'm still on an elk especially it's in the money yeah. I'm in the chips but what happens when I do the same thing for me at seventy to seventy five. 70, you know, 65 to 72, like now those single yard increments start to matter. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same thing for smaller statured or weaker, you know, people who can't draw as much poundage. They have the same problem, but at 30 and 40 yard ranges, they're at a real disadvantage. And so it is nice to have that zero for so many reasons. But one is, I just think it wounds less animals. I'm, I don't take more shots because I have it. I, I take, I take the same shots, but with more accuracy than I did before. Just that single pin level of accuracy. So that's cool too. And, uh, anyway, that's it for today's show. I hope you liked it. Leave us a comment. If you liked it, we always appreciate that. Go to the YouTube channel, subscribe, follow along there. Look for our next upcoming videos. And as always stay gritty.